So we're going to start our second panel for this forum. And uh, in this panel, we're going to discuss fac uh, faculty approaches to hybrid learning, uh, student process in hybrid classes, course press for student websites, and using Zoom uh, to bring invited speakers from overseas into the classroom and teaching with video using Media Library. So I have a wonderful group of faculty here to talk about each of their experiences. And I'll allow each of them to introduce themselves. Um, and I think I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Melissa Thomas. I'm an associate director here at the Center for Teaching and Learning. So we'll start in no particular order. Just Christy is right next to me. So sure. So hi, everyone. My name is Christy Posako. I am the director of career education and coaching at the Yale School of Management. I've been at Yale um, geez, 16 years. Most of that time, a little over half of it has been at the School of Management. Um, and my team focuses on delivering a uh, career management curriculum to our MBA and MAM students. Uh, my name is Stefan Simon. I'm at Yale since uh, three years. I'm director of Global Cultural Heritage Initiatives. My name is Angelica Gonzalez, and I'm the associate, uh, prof an associate professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Um, we uh, focus on development of, and my lab specifically, focuses on the development of new tissues for um, transplantation. But uh, in my courses, um, I have uh, um, focused on both um, uh, biomaterials and basic uh, teaching of uh, mechanical and uh, chemical and biological paradigms, uh, and then exploring biotechnology for infrastructure poor settings. I'm Jonathan Rooning Shearer. I teach statistics. I'm a senior lecturer now because I have enough gray hair. And I teach sort of between uh, the School of the Environment and Forestry and then the graduate school. Mostly, I think about how to get people to learn intro stats. I'll keep this mic here. And Jonathan, while you had the mic, um, I was just going to invite you to talk first about uh, what you do in your classroom. I actually had the pleasure of visiting your course um, in fall 2016 for Faculty Bulldog Days, and I saw an amazing use of polling in your classroom. Would you like to talk about that? Uh, yeah, so I guess, um, as Scott talked about earlier, I'm like the ultimate thief, which is I'm happy to steal everybody's ideas uh, if they work well. So over the last 10 years, um, I've been able to use clickers and turning point, and uh, we started a flip class about four years ago. Most recently, I've been thinking about um, kind of video technology. So all of our uh, every class I teach has a video capture now, and in addition, I have sort of a set of fifty kind of twelve minute intense content flipped videos that I've been using for the last uh, four years. And so um, I'd say, so you want to talk just about turning point first? Technology in general. I think I'm also the only guy here who actually teaches with a lightsaber. That's sort of one of the more newer technologies that I've started using recently. Um, uh, I think the so I'll say the main kind of thing that as uh, I've sort of have thought of recently. I always tell any class I teach, I'll sort of say, "Hi, my name is Jonathan," and I, what I really want to do is a Vulcan mind melt, and they know everything I know, and then we're done, and that's it. Unfortunately, I have to teach them through time. And um, as I get older, what I sort of understand is not only just like all, most people are nothing like me and they don't think like me, but they also experience reality not at the pace that I do. And in a class of 300 students, the pace at which they experience reality or that knowledge comes at them, there's a huge variability. And so I think uh, one of the uh, what I really try to think about now is not like to flip or not to flip, but really how do I provide a huge smorgasbord of learning opportunities for students so that under an older Oxford learning model, I'm going to give them all the tools they need to learn. And with so it'll be sort of uh, mostly carrots and not too many sticks, but so that they as students can sort of find inside themselves, how do they learn? So whether it's 400 pages of PDF notes, or it's being in class, or watching a video capture, or watching a flipped video. Because I do, and it's, it's interesting to like, for example, my flip videos, which are 12 minutes long, to sort of see for an individual student, how long do they spend with the video? For some of them, it's four minutes. Like they literally, they put it on triple speed, and they've got it, and they're ready to go. And other people, they watch it like seven times. And, um, and having a son who sort of experiences world at about 60% at the rate that I experience it, I'm very sensitive to sort of being able to provide that experience for other uh, other students. So I think that's enough for now. Great. So, um, and Angelica. So, I, uh, hear you have a blog that you use in your classroom. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. I understand so, you have some. <clears throat> 
Uh, yeah, I have examples of um, what the students have put up, if you'd like to um, show, show them. Uh, so the idea that um, uh, we came up with, I was working with Pam Patterson, who is an excellent resource here at the CTL, uh, was this idea that, um, well, what I would find in my biomaterials course specifically is that many of these students, as they would learn some of the basics of material science, uh, would come to me and say, oh, I work in this lab, and I was wondering how we can apply some of these material um, uh, inputs into our system, or or, oh, I was reading, I'm really interested in sports medicine, and I was wondering if you would know anything about this new um, meniscal repair method. And I was having to both go and do more research myself to figure out how to incorporate their ideas, but also um, really spending a lot of time trying to think about how to make um, the course much more engaging for them based on their varied interests. So my course isn't 300 students, it's 30 students, uh, usually about 30 students. So what I came up with was an idea to um, have them go ahead and teach me about what their interest is and also take the basic um, paradigm that we're learning in class, whether it's a uh, stress-strain curve and identifying different parts of that curve for mechanical identification of a material and apply it to their interest. So at the beginning of the semester, um, they can do, I think there's a, if you, uh, oh, it's scrolling through, great. So what you can see is they just choose something that they're interested in. And many of them, again, because they're junior, senior level students have chosen something related to a research lab that they've had some kind of experience in. Or it can be some sport that they're very interested in, but it really varies. So tissue engineering um, skin t uh, for skin tissues was one example. Uh, and what they'll do is uh, early on is identify where the lack of knowledge that they might have, or maybe identify where the field is now and how biomaterial advancement in this case could really be used to advance that field. And so it really gives them the buy-in early on to, hey, I should understand these basic concepts in order to understand more deeply my own field that I'm interested in, but then start thinking as a scientist on how can I make this even better? How can I advance um, science, because I also tell them that science belongs to everybody. It's not just my job to make things better. So if you're if you're invested in it, if you understand it, then you will um, advance science to the next levels. Uh, what I found is that they really um, they they seem to enjoy it. Uh, is especially if I keep them focused. So if I keep them focused and reiterate some of the basic points at the end of the the the, the day, um, that may apply broadly to different. Um, uh, uh, applications of biomaterials, then they take those and they write them into their blogs. They do one blog post a week. Um, again, my idea is that thinking about how to apply these instead of just memorization and then regurgitation and then throw it out after the exam, but thinking about how it applies to something they're interested in will really help them retain and even think about more advanced um, applications of, of what they're learning. Stefan, since you're sitting uh, right beside Angelico, would you like to talk about your experience using a tool we're pretty familiar with, Zoom, uh, to uh, connect lecturers from overseas to your students and the students in the classroom? Yeah, it was a pleasure. I think I prepared also a PowerPoint, which we can go quickly through. <clears throat> So we've been hosted by the CTL in the summer with our class in the YARO, the, 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 the Yale Global Summer Program, which is called the Sustainable Preservation of Cultural Heritage. Um, it has been really an amazing experience to be here and, and being like, you know, spoil, spoiled by all the colleagues of the CTL and from technical to, to also strategic and tactical advice. It, it, it was a wonderful experience. Um, we had students coming from all over the world, from the Yarrow Association, the International Association of Research Universities, Copenhagen, Beijing, um, Australia, ANU, um, Zurich, and so on. And we visited, of course, you know, of course, a lot of made a lot of excursions along uh, to the Yale collections, like the Center of British Art, the Peabody Museum, the Beinecke. Um and of course, restor restoration conservation uh, labs were also on our itinerary, but, you know, having a hands-on understanding for cultural heritage, you know, in that case, in the Babylonian collection with Agnete, um, that is a special value, I think, for, for the students and not, not listening and hearing things only secondhand. And we worked on a cemetery, a grocery cemetery, um, you know, sometimes at night because of our technology, which 
you know, we couldn't really use during the day. That's a special treat, I think, for students to work on a cemetery at night. Um, and and with all that, of course, you know, brings us back actually to this very room because because that's where where the class took place, and um, we had, of course, uh, human beings coming to class uh, is 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 the best. You know, we had uh, guests, uh, Holocaust survivors, because we have a little project on Jewish cemetery in Germany, documenting inscriptions. So we had actually um, Holocaust survivors from that very village living in Long Island just coming and. And, and talking to our students. And I think, of course, this experience, um, you know, as a 20, 22-year-old talking to somebody in the 90s who uh, just made it out of Germany on a kindertransport in the 1930s is is a very valuable experience. And unfortunately, you know, you can't, we can't do that for much longer because those this generation is just not, won't be around, uh, you know, much, much longer, hopefully, you know, <laughs> longer. But but the, the other point, which <clears throat> I think... Uh, you know, turns for 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 me and my experience here at the L, this uh, the city L, um, into what uh, you, you might really call the, the the teaching of the 21st century is really Zoom, because uh, as the, Dean Marvin Chan has said, that that is by no way comparable to all the other communication uh, you know programs which you have with Skype. Um, and, you know, you all know how that goes. You know, talking to your kids over Skype in another continent. And then you're usually asked, how was the audio connection? And you have to say it's good. Zoom is is really good because in Zoom, um, not only that everything is like real time, just an example, the audio connection is is you have a classroom, you have 20 people in the room, the, the microphone is so excellent, it picks up everything. We had people talking to us, um, you know, from Lima, from Peru about earthquakes. Um, we had... Um, Interpol actually they have special uh, you know requirements on their connectivity they can't just talk on Skype for example um, so they could use Zoom as well um, you know presenting as their insight from Lyon in France um, I think most importantly <clears throat> one of the best lectures we had was with Father Najib Mikhail Father Najib Mikhail is is the face of the destruction in Mosul Iraq he, he is a Dominican monk who rescued books and libraries. Um, is a very famous person in the field. And <clears throat> to give you one example, how that conversation with Father Najib worked, you know, he was walking in his, you know, uh, Dominican dress, or how you call that, or not. And, and one of the students asked, you know, yeah, but, you know, what are the conditions actually in your storage room now in Erbil, where he is? He, he joined us from Erbil, Kurdistan. And so he went with his cell phone, actually, <laughs> to, to the wall and showed us a thermometer which showed 37 degrees Celsius. And, and the student said, wow, you know, <laughs> that, when we talk about preventive conservation, 20 degrees, you know, in the museum. And that's, that's the reality. And it was, it was really as if Father Najib was with us. Um, and, and so I think this technology... It's definitely important in 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 a, in a situation where you know my students come and and they they, they want to study preservation of cultural heritage and they come here with this understanding that cultural heritage is about Van Gogh paintings and um, very quickly you know with these people to talk to seismic engineers from from Peru uh, legal experts from Santa Monica the police uh, Interpol and IGO in Lyon or or actually Father Nabil, um, N N Najib Mikhail. The, so they realize that cultural heritage is a much broader um, and a much more interdisciplinary and a much more heterogeneous uh, field, which goes very, very broadly across all disciplines. And I think that's that's the, the, the nice thing, that you can bring you know, speakers, that you can bring... Uh, experts from all around the world, and not just uh, you know divided by this. Actually, there has been the very screen here, right, or the other one, um, but really being with you in in the classroom. I think that's that's really. Um, I mean, just sharing some of the impressions with the students, and I'm sharing some of the evaluation with the students gave us back. Um, and and just the the bullet points, yes, you know, we got to speak to so many guest lecturers and so on. Made me realize that this field is not open, only open to everybody, but that everybody should be playing a role in it. And that, that would be also the punchline for my class. I think that cultural heritage preservation is based on stakeholder involvement. That is nothing which can be dealt with in a museum. 
is nothing which can be dealt with at a university like Yale or Oxford or whatever. It has to include everybody. It has to be all the people who can take ownership. That means, you know, the spirit of the place. That means the people in Iraq to the same extent the people in, in, in Europe and us. So that's why we had Holocaust survivors from a little village in Bavaria coming to class. That is why we have... Uh, people who rescue cultural heritage at the risk of their own life in Iraq during the war. And, and, and that, I think that makes the students um, to, to leave from here then, or to leave the class. Um, actually, this was another one. Would you recommend this course? Um, you know, they all say yes, because, I mean, actually, exclusively, everybody said yes, because it's a perfect example of interdisciplinary learning. And I think that... Um, you know, or a true perspective changer, regardless of one's background. Um, you know, I came here learning so much more than I ever thought I would. I think that, that um, you know, a lot of this credit actually goes to the CTL and to the great team actually at the CTL who, who, who made this possible for us to, to have these international students here in the summer. And it was really a wonderful experience. Thank you for sharing. So we were missing one of our panelists um, just a few minutes ago. So I'm going to invite Mary Evelyn Tucker on stage. Thanks, Mary Evelyn. She's going to um, introduce herself and perhaps talk about her uh, flipped courses. OK, great. Yeah. Um, sorry, I got caught behind a bus with children on it. And uh, I guess we have to be happy that they might be our students one day. Um, I'm going to talk about, uh, but first with great thanks uh, to Lucas and Sarah and Melissa, especially um, for the courses that we've been doing. Um, they're kind of large in terms of the content, um, but the outreach has been tremendous. Um, and the first one is Journey of the Universe, um, these MOOCs, which are the first um, certificate programs. Um, so there are... Yeah. <laughs> so Journey of the Universe is a project that began more than 10 years ago. Um, and it's a book from Yale Press, myself and a scientist, uh, Brian Swim. It's a film that was on PBS for three years. Um, it's a series of conversations that I did with scientists and environmentalists. Uh, and this sense of what is an evolving universe of 14 billion years. This took us 10 years to do the film uh, with scientists uh, from all across North America and so on. Um, but the conversations brings us down to where scientists are also talking about. So the emergence of galaxies or planets or stars or geological systems on Earth, how does it enhance the study of these parts of the evolutionary story by having a large narration. Now, others are doing this. Epic of Evolution is what Ed Wilson calls it. Uh, Eric Chasen calls it um, the, the march through time kind of thing, the arrow of time. He speaks about it. These are two scientists uh, in the Boston area, obviously. Um, but what we've been able to do um, through CTL is offer these um, as massive open online courses. So there's about 18,000, I think, um, watching them right now. But today we have a special, uh, wonderful announcement that they went into Chinese. Um, and uh, so all these courses are in Chinese. The film is in Chinese. We've just come back from 10 days in China, actually, where we showed it several times. The Chinese very much get this idea. Um, my area of study happens to be East Asia, China, and Japan. And the ideas of these traditions, especially Confucianism, are very coherent uh, with this film. So we've showed it for the last several years in China, and people have enjoyed it very much, actually. It almost went on CCTV several times, but this is why we're particularly happy about the Chinese versions. Um, we have, I'm going to talk just briefly, we have people doing... Uh, community mentoring to help monitor the feedback, um, the questions and so on that come up. But I'll say something more specifically about this in the next set of courses that we have. These have been very much inspired by Thomas Berry, um, who was a cultural historian. Uh, he'd studied both Asia and the West in great depth, had a library of 10,000 books, um, was a, a Renaissance um, scholar. These are very rare these days, but he inspired Journey of the Universe, but he also inspired, because he was a historian of world religions, the cultures that we're teaching now on world religions and ecology. 
Um, my husband, John Grimm, teaches these with me. He's a specialist in indigenous traditions. As I say, my specialty is Asian religions. Um, but we spent many years in graduate school with Thomas Berry and scholars at Columbia studying these traditions. Um, Berry's notion was an ecological ethic is needed. I don't think we need to argue that, but he had very powerful writings on this. This is just one phrase. We have ethics for homicide and suicide, but not for biocide and geocide. And our concern was, well, what is it in the world's religions, including indigenous traditions, that might respond to this uh, huge... So when I first went to Japan in 73, 74, here was Fuji. Here it is later, <laughs> um, even nowadays. When I went to China in the early 80s, here are some of the beauty of the countryside. And here it is uh, today. You know, we just got back incredibly polluted, incredible problems of, uh, as you'll see here, here's Guilin, but here's the river systems with amazing pollution and water that doesn't even reach um, the ocean <clears throat> in many of these rivers that are drying up. Um, this is Beijing when I first went there in the 84, and of course, many of these cities look like this today. So between population growth, the expansion from 2 billion to 6 billion in one century, and of course, increased consumption, we have a crisis unprecedented in our 200,000 years of being human. So... Our concern was we weren't scientists or policy people or lawyers, and we need science, we need policy, we need law, we need economics, we need technology, but we also need values and ethics. And the ethics are going to look different in China and Japan and India. And India and China are changing the face of the planet with modernization, uh, with the burst towards new technology, with an economic um, economy devouring resources from around the world. So <clears throat> we began a project at Harvard on world religions and ecology, three years of survey, world's religions, and these are some of the books that we're using in the courses now. So I'm concluding <clears throat> here, and then I'll say just a few words about how these courses are going. We have... Um, Introduction to Religion and Ecology, Western Religion and Ecology, South Asian Religions and Ecology, Hinduism and Buddhism, East Asian Religions and Ecology, Confucianism, Taoism and Buddhism, and Native American Religions and Ecology. Now, these were encouraged, I have to say, by our last dean at the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, where we have appointments as well as divinity and religious studies. But Peter Crane was particularly eager to work with CTL um, on these courses. And um, the, the idea being, and Gus Speth, the dean before that, was the one who brought us to Yale 12 years ago for a joint program in world religions and ecology. Now, what I want to say, and I really thank my fellow panelists here, is in 45 years of teaching, this has been, I think, the most exciting method of teaching. And again, I salute CTL for helping us. And I want to mention especially Matt's help on another series with Journey of the Universe for alums between Divinity School and Forestry School, which we had a great time doing. And our colleague Brian Swim joined us for weekly um, uh, sessions with people in those courses. But what's so terrific about this, the MOOCs are, of course, hard to have feedback with that many people, but some of Brian Swim's students and our students are acting as mentors to do that. But I want to maybe conclude on this, this note that we have questions every week for these religion and ecology classes. So they are online posting answers to these questions, but then they're posting responses to the other students. So by the time they come into our class, which is flipped or hybrid, um, they have already had a very robust conversation, and they know, the, as Lucas said in his post and, and so on. So a conversation and a community has already developed, and when we come to class, it is robust, it's exciting. These are classes of 25 to 27 students, but um, it is absolutely electrifying, I think, um, as, as with the student involvement, because 
they see our lectures, they see other people who are coming from different parts of the world that we interview and, and so on and so forth. They see films that they couldn't do in a seminar. We wouldn't have had time. Um, but we can really get into discussion, which has great depth. So I thank you all at CTL for helping with that. So, Christy, uh, speaking of working with Matt from CTL, you've worked extensively with Matt on the Slingshot program uh, at SOM. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. Um, so, two years ago, we launched a hybrid or flipped classroom course, uh, career management course. And it's been really interesting hearing everyone's unique challenges. Um, our unique challenge is that despite the importance of career outcomes, our career management course is not required. Um, so when you think about the content that it encompasses, resumes, networking, interviewing, it's not necessarily the most compelling content, um, and we need to get students excited about it. So prior to Slingshot, we had um, we delivered the content via live lecture on Fridays. So I'm sure you can imagine the absolute joy with which students would come to a two-hour cover letter lecture on a Friday afternoon. So needless to say, we had attendance problems. Um, it was difficult to get students there on a Friday. The other piece um, uh, of the puzzle was students engage in the job search at different points during the year. So students who are engaged in a banking or consulting job search would be doing so um, in the fall. Students interested in buy-side finance or education or nonprofits would be doing so in the spring. So we were forced to sort of teach to the front end of that process. Uh, students weren't able to make up the material in any easy way. So we, we kind of got to the point uh, three years ago, just about now, like there has to be a better way to do this. And we engaged CTL and we uh, thought through a hybrid or flipped classroom approach. Um, we currently offer it on Canvas. And essentially, we teach the same stuff, um, but we do it in a way um, that really engages students. Uh, the videos uh, are really the star of the show. They're short videos. All of them are less than 10 minutes. Um, and though they do feature a talking head approach, um, they, they also feature students. And they feature students in job search scenarios. So we know, based on our experience, students tend to make the same mistakes over and over again in interviews, talking with employers, networking. So we were able to cast about 50 students in these vignettes um, where they show themselves making these mistakes. Um, and the beauty of that is their colleagues get to see um, this, this modeling from their peers. So it's much more credible than if, you know, mom and dad, i.e. our office, was telling them what to do and not to do. But we also do a lot of success modeling as well. So we show students what they should be doing well and what is, what is um, uh, going to work for them uh, during their, their job search. So the flipped classroom piece to that um, would be the live learning lab. So each module, and the, the modules um, are things like resume, cover letter, all the usual suspects. After watching the videos, the students come to what we call a live learning lab, where they meet in small groups with five of their peers and a second year MBA career coach, and they practice the concepts in the videos. So for instance, in the interviewing lab, they get a behavioral question. They have to answer the question, so why did you choose the Yale School of Management? So they answer these questions, they get feedback from their peers, which is a big part of it. If you can give feedback to somebody based on concepts you just learned, you're much more likely to retain those concepts. And then the other thing students really like is they're able to hear their peers practice. And they realize, gosh, everyone else is kind of working at this too. They hear different approaches. Um, so they like the fact that they can engage in this way and then they walk out of the room a better candidate. They feel more prepared. Um, so, I mean, just briefly, I can sum up and say this has been wildly successful. Um, as the LSOM grows, as you all know, we're adding degree programs, we're growing within the MBA population, we're constantly thinking of ways to scale Slingshot and meet the unique needs of different populations. Um, I have some data here uh, that's kind of fun. Uh, so for instance, uh, back three years ago when we were still delivering lectures, uh, we had 40% of the first year MBAs at an interviewing lecture. In the past two years, we've had over 90% at the learning labs. So they're liking what they see in the videos, they're realizing there's value in our content and they're coming and they're learning and they're getting jobs. Um, and it looks like our employment data is up this year based on the past two years. Um, which is the first class. So the class of 2017 was the first year to go through the entire Slingshot curriculum. So the, the data is uh, pointing in a good direction. Um, and uh, one other thing I'll mention is we brought this to a uh, global uh, conference a few years ago, and other business schools liked it so much they asked us if we could license 
some of the content. So we spent some time um, rewriting the content, sort of packaging it for license, and we have licensed it to several schools. So it's kind of fun being a thought leader in the career management space for graduate business programs. So a big thanks to uh, to Matt and Sarah and Tom and, and all those who helped us think through this and continue to, to make it work. Great, thank you for sharing. And before I open it up to questions, I know Jonathan had a little bit more he wanted to share. Is that right? I'm good. Are you sure? Okay. <laughs> all right, then I'll open it up to uh, questions, Q and A. Uh, so just one thing to say, thank you all for the kind words, but I just want to include one other team we have because they're here behind the cameras, and that's the team at the Yale Broadcast Studio. Because just to show their versatility, they are I know they work very closely with you all on developing the flipped courses, and it's not just how do we record this, but really what are your goals and what is it that we're trying to get to. And I know they're hidden behind there, so I just wanted to mention them that they're also here recording this. Uh, Jonathan, you mentioned that you have – you know, different types of students, some that watch these videos in four times the speed, some that watch it seven times. If you think back to a time when that wasn't possible, and this may be a tough question to answer, do you see that, I don't want to use the term the, the bottom half of your class, but maybe they do perform better because, like, do you have data that supports that to say, you know, they're clearly being helped by this? Here you go. I don't know. Hey, how about that? Okay. Uh, yes, I would say I don't, I, I don't have the exact numbers in front of you, but there's no question that being able to provide a wide range of learning opportunities, uh, it deals with a lot of small problems that would have come up before. So teaching at the Forestry School, they go to a lot of conferences. They miss at least 15 to 20% of every class. Not a problem anymore. They're like, I'm going to be out of town. Doesn't matter. The video's online. You can watch either the video capture or the you know, their lecture. They're sick. Not a problem. I had a student today who was like, oh my gosh, this thing came up. I'm three weeks behind. Before, I might have said, like, sorry, you're dead. But now, like, as long as you're self-motivated, not a problem. Um, uh, another kind of unique feature about being up at the forestry school is, I can't remember, the, it's like 30 to 40% students from foreign countries. And I know I talk fast and I try to enunciate, but still, for some of them, like, they're having to do second language translation. Being able to, like, slow things down has made it much easier for them. So definitely, you know, sort of looking at, even if I don't, it, I mean, I, um, I, I would say the, the grades are, uh, have always been decent, and they're maybe a little bit higher, but certainly I don't, there are fewer tiers in my office now uh, for people who just sort of felt like, I'm just not getting it, I'm lost, and I can say, look, pure, you're going to be fine here, all these resources, so... Yeah, it's, it's actually, I mean, to me, when I sort of think about why do I use technology, I think technology for technology's sake is like a waste. Uh, but uh, I think about like all the problems that I've been able to solve with things like people out of town, people not being able to the same, going the same speed. One of the, I was thinking another thing that's been great is kind of switching how we do grading. 300 students, 12 TAs, they don't all grade the same. That's 4,000 assignments. Just trying to get the assignments to the TA and back, huge mess. Canvas, now everyone electronically, it comes in, it gets graded electronically, no problem. So that's the next big thing I'm thinking about is like, how can I, I mean, okay, so I hate assessment. It's boring. I wish they would just get excited about the material, but I have to assess them and they need a, little, a few sticks. So my, the next big thing I'm thinking about, how do I really um, try to even out how grading happens and also provide more opportunities for self-assessment and some get some hybrid of like the stuff that's a number, great, it'll get automatically graded, don't waste the TA's times. And then they can spend more time really kind of helping students get details. Okay. Thank you. Hi, this is for Angelica. Um, to the extent you can generalize, what aspects of blogging or even more generally online writing, online creation, uh, do your students seem to get quickly and what aspects do they need more scaffolding from you or from their peers on? Um, so uh, 
one of the things that, um, I don't know if it's generational, because I'm very old now, I feel, <laughs> um, that these students gravitate towards is being able to um, apply graphics to these, uh, um, to express themselves graphically. So whether it's collection of images from um, other sites or uh, primary literature, research literature, uh, they do really well with that. Translating those um, graphical images or uh, kind of concepts that they see in an image into an explanation of what mechanical testing is and, and what the outcomes actually mean um, is where I start to see um, uh, a little bit of a, 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 a downward slope. In it. But w what actually happens there is that then I can have con con contact with them and I can say, oh, you know what, we talked about this concept in class, come, come chat with me and let's... Um, let's evaluate it a little bit more critically. Let's talk about what this actually means, how you can interpret this figure that you put in there to uh, more meaningful outcomes. Uh, so it really, um, in one sense, is a really great assessment tool because it allows me to go and say, uh, what we see where they're, they're not completely able to integrate the uh, information they're using in class to these graphical, fun, kind of uh, more applied uh, ideas. Um, but it also does some of the self-assessment because I think they, they get to see, oh yeah, I couldn't completely explain how the equations we used in class applied to this figure. So they come to me often and say, I, I really wanted to understand more how, how, how to uh, translate the math into the meaning behind this graphical data. I hope that answers your question. Any further questions? Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks for a great set of presentation. A lot of passion, a lot of expertise around the delivery there. I'm just interested in the fact that Generally speaking, uh, you've been using technology, at least in the cases you present here today, um, for the first order uh, uh, sharing of information with students as they learn. And I'm wondering if you've used technology of the type you've been using here or otherwise in terms of um, supporting students when you are giving feedback on their formal assessments. A lot of research suggesting that that is a, a critical uh, turning point for students who maybe are struggling, not so much the providing of information or them even discovering the information, but the ways in which they learn from feedback. So I'm wondering any examples connected to your current courses around how you've used technology to help students, uh, you know, really capture that dividend from the feedback you or your colleagues might give them. So in the, in the MOOCs, the online classes, of course, there's um, short answer uh, things that are automatically graded. But um, there's also, as I was mentioning, community mentors who come in and make comments. And as well, that's what we do on the classes here at Yale. So each week and each response, they are getting feedback from John, myself, or a TA. We kind of divide it divided up but um, so you can as you post there's pl there's places for response and you can help the thread uh, continue as well so it's a it's very interactive all, not just with the students but I should have mentioned with um, the professors as well uh, yeah I would say actually um, the biggest change about flipping for so I have it's kind of interesting. I've got a pool of about 150 students who could take a flipped class, and only 30 of them pretty consistently decide every year that that's the version that they like. Those 30 love it, and um, the, what's really changed for them is when I have them for an hour, we meet in a computer lab. And um, statistics is the field it is now because of computers. You know, 100 years ago, even 30 years ago, was theoretical. Now you can actually do it. And so um, I answer questions for 15 minutes based on the online feedback, that, you know, what do you don't get? But then we jump right on the computers. And so, uh, so I have myself in a TA. And so, I mean, we can help them get immediate sort of a sense of, like, they get to experience the data. We can help them not waste time on, like, how do I get to the right place in the computer program? But also we can do differentiated computer packages. So we have three different sort of packages, depending on what people like to use, running, like, in the same classroom. And then the students themselves can sort of give feedback. So it's sort of 30 minutes of, like, let's do data analysis. And then I randomly 
choose different people to sort of present. So the other thing is that they actually, uh, I was talking to someone earlier today, one of the hardest things I think in stats is not just doing the stats, but actually talking about the stats afterwards. Um, and so they get practice now actually sort of talking about statistics. I get to give them mostly non-threatening feedback and, you know, and they, you know, and sort of people can learn from each other. Anyway, being able to like take that time away and just like have hands on the feedback generally is like, uh, so uh, people are sometimes nervous about taking this flipped class because it sounds like more work because you have to watch the videos and you still have to come to class and you still have to do all the homework. But the reviews have said, well, the homework went a lot faster because I didn't waste a lot of time spinning my wheels because we had done similar things in the lab already, and so it was a much more efficient process, I think, for them. I probably don't need one. I can be pretty loud. Um, so I'll try it anyway. It's, it's, really it's a good. Okay, fantastic. So uh, we actually give feedback in two ways. We do leverage the quiz functionality in Canvas, and uh, we even go a little bit deeper. So whatever student an answer chooses, they get reinforcing content. So if they get the answer wrong, they learn why, we give them a little hint as to what the right answer is, and we found that this is really useful. And we do ask that the student pass the quiz with 100%. They can have repeated attempts before they attend the, um, the live learning lab. So we send out um, reminders, if you haven't taken the quiz, please do so. But then the real feedback comes in that live setting where they get individualized feedback. Our students really, really want the sort of one-on-one -on -one personalized feedback. That's what they, they really come for. I just wanted to mention as well, this this uh, system allows, to pick up this point, feedback of students to one another, um, which I think uh, helps enormously. And they're, they're correcting each other if a statement is not well done. And I must also just say their writing is astoundingly good because it's visible, you see, to the rest of the class. And it's sort of this pause. They think and then they write instead of just raising their hand in class. And as well, the shy person, male or female, in the back of the class who might not comment is commenting and often brilliantly. So it's very exciting to see that um, interaction. Um, I, so as, as far as feedback, one of the things that I um, use to give feedback directly um, to the students is comments, um, just like on their uh, Facebook pages or every, any other um, social um, technology they use. They love to hear somebody comment directly about the article they posted, the perspective on, on the science. Um, and so I can give them direct feedback about, oh, did you see this new paper that kind of contradicts this science that you're, you've talked about? So kind of leading them deeper into what they're evaluating, their peers will also comment on their blog posts. And so that gives them an idea of, oh, yes, I, I've explained it in a way that uh, you know, people can understand it. I've explained it in a way that is cohesive with where the class was going and people are, are enthusiastic about it. And I guess the other thing that I do, um, probably not using the technology as much as direct for direct feedback, is um, for every lecture, I take somebody's post and I put it on the board. And we discuss, oh, so this post uh, talked a little bit about um, you know, let, let's review from last lecture. This post in particular brought up the point that uh, whatever it is that we're trying to um, elucidate or, or remind them of, uh, and they really uh, feel drawn in by that. I, I don't think I appreciate it until using these kind of um, concepts or these ideas, how um, disengaged many students feel from their courses, the lecture, the information. But once they see something that they've created, um, put onto the board, and kind of uh, something built around it, they open up, they are ready to engage, and often will say, oh yeah, and I didn't post this part, but this was a really exciting um, part of that, that article as well. Um, so I think the peer feedback. The yeah, engagement. just to build on that, what we do is have uh, about three students a week choose questions based on the posting, and then they, they lead the discussion. We, of course, uh, jump in, but it's, again, a student-led discussion on what were the key questions that week on the, the various postings. And it's very successful because it's student-oriented. Great. Any further questions? Jenny? I have a question for Angelica. So I've had the pleasure of seeing you in action in class and seeing how engaged your students are live as well as with the, the blog postings. Do you have any comments about longer term outcomes of this engagement? So maybe seeing them in research labs or interested in grad school, anything you have to say about that? 
that uh, becomes one of the more exciting parts of it for me because what um, what I what I was as I mentioned some of them would have had research experiences or um, have interests and then they kind of end when I'm just delivering flat uh, information to them without application or engagement. Um, some of the uh, after the first year of doing this, some of the um, uh, evaluations at the end of the year said this course helped me get a job. This course helped me get an internship because they were able to go in and discuss not just, oh yes, I've taken a course that discusses uh, whatever it is that I'm teaching, but they could discuss, oh, I was taking a course and I really got into this idea that um, uh, health system networks can be evaluated with these kind of concepts. So really thinking about not just the basics of the course, but how they could use it in another setting or how they could apply it real world, which is really what we're looking for when we're looking for grad students, interviewing grad students, um, looking for people to, to work in different um, contexts and companies. I think one of the um, other aspects that this did was it gave, in what the feedback I got from the students was that it gave them, um, again, a sense of buy-in to science. I think too often um, in the courses that, that I teach, they um, expect me to deliver facts, 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 and that's the end of the scientific story. Um, and so what they end up seeing by reading some of this primary literature and being able to formulate some questions around this is we don't know everything and there's a lot more to be done and they now have some of the, the the information that can help them dig into these questions a little bit better maybe build some concepts around it and so graduate school uh, so I, I've seen more from my class students coming out and saying hey are, is, are there people who actually study this at Yale are there student uh, graduate programs that you're familiar with how do I get into grad school so those conversations happen more and more when they see themselves um, as scientists thinking about these questions Thank you for sharing. I want to thank everyone for their questions and also thank the panel for uh, sharing their experiences with uh, technology in the classroom. And next we'll have David Hirsch. But we'll talk